Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar, Safeguarding the Future of the Feed Supply Chain. My name is Kim Knoll. I work for Bureau Veritas, and I'll be hosting the webinar today and introducing you to our presenters. Here is our agenda. Um, our speakers will provide a brief introduction to FAMI QS version 6, followed by a discussion on the feed fraud and defense modules. Then we will share data on, the, on what are the most common non-conformances from completed FAMI QS version 6 audits so far. At the end, we'll have a live Q&A session. Okay, so we have two presenters joining us today. First, I would like to introduce Angela Pellegrino. Angela is an independent consultant with 35 years experience in quality control, quality assurance, and various certification schemes. She is involved in risk analysis, risk assessments, feed and food fraud and defense projects for different governments and organizations. She is also a trainer to quality standards for industry, laboratories, and regulators. She has worked as a technical expert for the Food and Agricultural Organization and the International Feed Industry Federation. She participates in the technical expert group for FAMIQS and is involved in different projects as a technical advisor. And our second presenter is Chris Middleton. Chris is my colleague here at Bureau Veritas, and he is our food program manager for North America. Chris leads our food safety certification team, managing all deliverables to our clients with regards to our safety and quality certification services. Chris is qualified as an auditor for a number of different food and feed safety standards, including FAMIQS. He participates in um, a number of different technical working groups and has over 15 years experience conducting audits for the industry. So that is a quick introduction to Angela and Chris. Both are wonderful resources and available for any questions that may arise after our presentation today. And with that, I will turn it over to Angela to begin our discussion. Oh, thank you, Kim, for the nice uh, introduction uh, of, Kim, of uh, Chris and myself. Thank you very much. And also thank you to Bureau Veritas for inviting us uh, to talk about the new version of the FAMIQS code. Uh, in this slide, I have, uh, this is the homepage of uh, FAMIQS. I invite everybody to visit our website. Uh, there is a lot of information there. Uh, all the documents that we are going to talk about today, uh, they are freely available at the website and uh, is a very important resource for those companies that are interested in FAMQS certification. I would like to start saying that differently from other um, uh, feed safety or food safety schemes, uh, FAMQS um, certification includes and covers uh, not only safety, but also quality aspects of processes and products. So uh, it's a larger system and uh, we will also be approaching in most of the requirements of the standards, uh, not only the fit safety, but also the quality aspects. To talk a little bit uh, about uh, the organization from QS, uh, I show you here uh, you know, very basic organization chart uh, to give you an overview uh, of uh, the FAMIQS uh, as a scheme owner. Our offices are based in Brussels, in Belgium. FAMIQS was founded in 2004, uh, and it was a response to the EU regulation environment that made reference to specific industry codes, and uh, the aim was, was to facilitate the implementation of the law. So, uh, the first uh, version of uh, the code was really a response to this environment uh, and now it has uh, grown a lot and um, has been spreaded all over the world. Uh, 
Uh, in this organization chart, you know, the part that uh, we will probably have more contact uh, with is the one that is in, um, in the box that is in the light shades of orange. So the people that are really working on the certification management, uh, all the, the documents of the standards, and the secretary general. If we look at the map of the globe, uh, we can see uh, the expansion of uh, the PharmQS uh, scheme. Uh, in the dark orange uh, shaded areas, uh, you know, these are areas or regions uh, where uh, certified uh, companies are based. Uh, and the light shade uh, orange, you know, are still uh, areas or regions that uh, we do not have uh, any organization uh, certified. So it's quite uh, global. Uh, and it's a standard that has been very much required in the international business. Um, here, you know, to uh, t uh, tell you a little bit why uh, the code was revised uh, and uh, why this new version uh, 6 was published. There were several uh, different motivations that led to this present version. And they are in this um, little um, charts here, these four charts. First of all, uh, there were new regulatory developments, um, especially in China and uh, the, in the United States. We also uh, received uh, feedback from many regulators because remember that one uh, of the intentions of the code was really to facilitate the implementation of the regulations in some um, countries in the world. So uh, this was one of uh, uh, the, the motivations that uh, led to version 6. Also, and it is uh, a quality and safety systems, of course, we, uh, we also have to uh, look for continuous improvement. And uh, feedback was also received from members and partners. And also we uh, look carefully at the results from our integrity program. So there was opportunity for improvement. There was room for that. And that was done in the new version. The accreditation standards also change it. Can you go back? Yeah, thank you. Uh, the accreditation standards also change it. There was a new publication of 17021. And also uh, in the family of 22,000, more specifically 22,006 part six, uh, 2002 part six, sorry, uh, the prerequisite programs for FEED uh, were published. And, uh, you know, uh, as an international development, uh, we also had to uh, improve the, the standard in view of the high level structure uh, with the publication of uh, ISO 9001 and uh, the new version of 22,000. And because many of the certified companies, uh, they do have uh, different systems implemented and uh, it would facilitate uh, to integrate them with FAMIQS. This uh, process uh, took us around three years. Uh, we started uh, moving forward with a draft uh, of the code version 6. This draft was then sent to the FAMIQS expert group for their inputs. Uh, after their comments, um, it was sent to different regions where we had uh, local uh, working groups. One of them is the United States. And then after uh, the comments uh, were received from uh, these different regions, it was then sent back to the expert group for their further comments, uh, sent to the board of FAMIQS for their inputs. According to the international protocol, uh, uh, it was submitted to public consultation. After the comments received from public consultation, it was then delivered back to the expert group for their inputs. And then uh, the final uh, version 6 was published and it was around September 2017. 
So the standard now in version 6 complies with the high level structure of ISO uh, and it has 10 chapters, uh, you know, the same structure of all the standards that are, uh, you know, derived from 9001. Okay, so the standard is now fit for international implementation. It was reorganized uh, in order to meet the high level structure. Uh, you know, the approach is quality, safety, and also fraud and defense. And we are going to look at these two new pillars uh, as we go down the track. Uh, and also, uh, the text was elaborated um, a little bit more on the requirements so that we would have more, gu more guidance and also to avoid any misinterpretation. Uh, one of the features of the, of the code uh, was about the scope adaptation. When we started in 2004, it was mainly focused on, um, on the definitions of the EU regulations. The regulation in EU was changed in 2009, so there were some adaptations to the scope because it was not only feed additives and premixtures anymore, but uh, the EU regulation uh, at that time uh, gave a new definition of a term that they called specialty feed ingredients and mixtures. And in 2017, with version 6, uh, we then introduced uh, the expression specialty feed ingredients, and that's um, uh, how we call uh, the, the ingredients or the products that are coming out of the processes that are eligible for Farming US certification. And what is a specialty feed ingredient? A specialty feed ingredient is uh, any intentionally added ingredient that is normally consumed as feed by itself or else it does not provide the animal a complete or daily ration, uh, but it does uh, have a nutritional or may not have a nutritional uh, value, but it affects uh, the characteristics of the feed or animals, the performance, uh, enhancing the performance of the animal, for example. So, specialty feed ingredients are simply uh, ingredients that are produced by one of the FAMIQS recognized processes, and we are going to see what these processes are. And uh, these ingredients, uh, they uh, must have a specific functionality. They must be either technological, sensorial, nutritional, or zootechnical. And so this gives us the opportunity, if we look at the next slide, uh, to include more products uh, in the scope that was not possible in the past because it was more or less tied to the European regulation and to the EU feed register. So here's some examples of uh, uh, products that before they were considered feed materials and therefore could not be included in FAMIQS scope. But now, because they do comply with one of the recognized processes, they are eligible to certification. And uh, if we look at the, the processes that uh, we call them the recognized process, they are basically six different processes. Uh, and from them, you know, the products that are called the special to, uh, feed ingredients uh, come from. So they are uh, a, chem a chemical process, a bioprocessing process, mining process, an extraction process, mixing and a formulation process. So if a company is interested in certifying uh, their process um, according to the FAMIQS standard, it has 
uh, to belong to any uh, of these six different uh, uh, manufacturing processes. Also, and uh, adding to uh, the scope that should be uh, related to one of the six processes, PharmQS also defines uh, two different activities. So in order to uh, be certified, a company has to be operating under one of these two uh, different activities, either a, being a trader or having a trading activity or then being involved in a production activity or else placing products uh, on the market under the name of the producer. And here we have the main documents uh, of the system. So the FAMIQS code of practice it is a mandatory document and where you know, all the requirements are stated. And the code works together with what we call the process documents. Remember that we had the six different processes that are recognized. So each of these six processes has a process document. And what is in this process document? No, simply uh, the document brings mainly the structure for the AGCCP plans that will have to be constructed in the system uh, so that uh, it complies to the certification requirements. Also, and very uh, important, and the first thing that, you know, any company that uh, decides to go for the certification uh, should comply with is the... ...trees, manufacturer is operating, and the country of the destination where the manufacturer or the producer is sending uh, his products to. So it is the responsibility of the operator or the manufacturer, as we call it, uh, we call the manufacturer and operator, uh, to take care of the compliance to the regulation. So FAMIQS has no legal authority uh, to check the compliance of the regulation. Of course, uh, you know, the main regulations will be looked at during the certification process, but no legal action can be taken by any certification body or any um, certification or scheme owner. So here, let's take a look at uh, the code and the different uh, chapters so that we have an overview, especially of the changes in this new version 6. So, uh, first of all, uh, as uh, any of these new standards that, uh, you know, comply or follow the high level structure, uh, they are risk-based systems, and that happens with FAMIQS as well. So, uh, version 6 is a risk-based uh, uh, system and has this approach. Uh, therefore, we have to understand the context in which the company is inserted and identify all the external and internal risks that can affect the ability of the company to achieve the intended result uh, that was planned for the feed safety and quality management system. Also, in the same direction and according to the high-level structure of this uh, risk-based concept, uh, we have to identify uh, the needs and expectations of the interested parties. Uh, they may be external parties as our clients, our customers, regulatory authorities, uh, any other um, external uh, party that we have relation with, and also the internal parties being our internal departments in the company or uh, maybe any branch in a corporation. 
So this should be taken into account as well. And it's part as in ISO in the same uh, chapter that is chapter four. In the next slide, okay, here uh, we have to determine the scope. And why? Uh, we have to consider uh, that uh, the previous elements, or else the scope, the boundaries of the system, the applicability of it, uh, the market where we are uh, operating, uh, and, the, uh, and all the impact that it may have in our processes and requirements that we have to follow in the standard are taken care of. So we do have to document the scope, taking into account you know, the context that was studied before, the needs and expectations of the parties, the sites uh, where the system will be implemented, and uh, how uh, it will be uh, operating. Here we see, and uh, uh, a quick mention here, I just put the slide to make uh, uh, um, uh, a comment uh, that, okay, uh, we, of course, we are going to uh, need a feed safety and quality policy to be uh, stated and to be included in our system, but FAMIQS is now requiring that in the feed safety and quality policy, we do include the two pillars that are the fraud uh, and defense uh, uh, programs or uh, system that we are going to see afterwards. So our um, policy will have to state uh, a commitment uh, to really uh, look uh, for possibilities or vulnerabilities for fraud and how we have the defense uh, plan implemented in the system. Leadership will play a very important part in this new system uh, and uh, has more responsibilities uh, and not only will be directly involved uh, uh, in the systems providing or giving support uh, to, uh, to other uh, uh, parties, in internal parties, but also uh, giving directions to uh, specific personnel and helping these uh, people to achieve the results that were planned for the system. So here, one thing that um, you should expect is that um, the auditor really will talk to the leader or to the management of the company, trying to check uh, their involvement in the system and how the system uh, operates and how they, are, they participate uh, uh, in this operation. Okay, so here, uh, this is chapter six um, that requires actions to address the risks and opportunities that were raised uh, when we define it the context and when we define it the need and expectations uh, of the interested parties. Uh, so here we have to propose actions to eliminate, mitigate, or accept the risks and maybe to uh, enhance the opportunities that uh, we uh, raised it or that uh, we found and that uh, uh, we reviewed while working on chapter four, uh, there was the context of the system. Now going to operation in here and now we are going to production and uh, really to the floor of the plant. Chapter seven. Chapter seven is about good manufacturing practices. So here, uh, you know, the, the, the important message is we are going to have uh, prerequisite programs that are the GMPs. They are going to be associated with the, with the AJCCP plan that we are going to see in chapter eight. 
and this is going to uh, help us to control the hazard. One thing very important, the good manufacturing practices or the PRPs, they should be developed and implemented prior to starting the AJCCP plan development because they are a prerequisite to the AJCCP. So, in this chapter 7, and uh, we are not going to speak here in detail, uh, but, uh, you know, approaching each of the different entries in the chapter, but there is much more text in this chapter and a lot more detail in the chapter that uh, I believe, um, and I'm sure Chris uh, will highlight some um, uh, uh, of uh, some of the, the the details here when he talks about the non-conformities. But in this chapter ch seven, the GMPs, they were revised uh, to include uh, the requirements and update also the language and uh, uh, have more details uh, that are also brought by ISO TS 22002 part 6 that are the feed PRPs and also uh, your safety, food safety modernization act. Uh, in order to prevent problems uh, in the uh, manufacturing of the products rather than relying uh, primarily on reacting to them. So here uh, we have the complete list uh, of the practices that are the good manufacturing practices. Uh, they are um, in six different uh, uh, entries in the code and uh, each of, uh, of them brings specific uh, requirements on how uh, to uh, what are the, the requirements and, and what are uh, 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 the details or what we have to comply with in terms of uh, the prerequisite programs. And chapter eight uh, is about operations. So here we are going to look at the operational uh, planning and control. So uh, not only about uh, the designing of the process, the operational process, but also how we are going to document these processes, uh, what are the criteria that we have for them, uh, and how they are controlled or monitored. In this chapter, something very important, and this is also uh, uh, different from uh, other systems, design and development uh, for PharmaQS uh, cannot be excluded from the management system because we are talking about a safety system and in the safety system and because it includes a GMP in the AJCCP, uh, any changes that are made in raw material, equipment, processes, any type of formulation, it does impact the system. So these uh, changes are also considered by FAMIQS as design and development. And uh, you are going to see uh, in H.3, you know, a whole a guidance at, on how to uh, draw your design and development process. And it's very straightforward. Do not overcomplicate that, okay? All right, important for uh, in the chapter of operation and in other systems we have that also. We have to look if we have external provision of services and processes. If you hire uh, or if you contract a manufacturer uh, to uh, deliver part of uh, the process or an intermediary product or then if you were working with uh, an external warehouse 
these are external uh, services that are also part of your flowchart, that are also part of your system. So they should be considered uh, um, in the system as contract manufacturing. So you should uh, then review uh, the, the, the way they operate, if they are certified or not certified, uh, because that is going to give you more or less guarantees. If they are certified and, uh, and PharmaQS, uh, will accept according to a document that's also in the website and it's part of the mandatory uh, documents for certification. Uh, they recognize its standards. So not only uh, a manufacturer that is certified by FAMIQS, but there are other standards also that FAMIQS has mutual recognitions with that can also be applied. But if uh, your contract manufacturer is not certified, then you have to take uh, a further action. You may have to perform a full audit and then you will have to inform also your CV that you do have a contract manufacturer that you chose to perform an audit and your CB may then request for the audit uh, report and they all, uh, the CB may also request um, to visit uh, this supplier if he still needs to uh, more information that he cannot find in your report. So this is contract manufacturers. And in the next slide, we are going to see the purchase of materials. So here we are talking about uh, the, the purchasing of raw materials, packaging materials, and uh, other inputs that we use in our processes. We do not have uh, anymore the famous decision tree. So uh, they are not, they were uh, excluded from the system and they were turned into requirements. So there's still uh, the, the classification of assured and non-assured sources. So you are able to uh, purchase materials from assured and non-assured sources. So assured sources are those sources that are certified by FAMIQS or any other recognized standard uh, that is listed in this document that's um, showed here, the PMS003, recognized standards available in the website. And a non-assured source would be a supplier that is not FAMIQS certified or is also not certified by any other the recognized scheme. So for these non-assured sources, you would have them uh, to uh, have a different uh, approach in your system in order to guarantee that you are receiving uh, quality and safe uh, raw materials and that you are not going to end up with an unsafe product or a product that's not according to your quality specification. If we go uh, further on operation, then we have the AJCCP program. Uh, as we said before, uh, the AJCCP uh, will follow the methodology uh, that is stated in the process documents, those six documents that are mandatory and that uh, the auditor um, can uh, uh, um, require uh, or can compare your system with. Uh, these documents uh, and the AJCCP methodology follows the Codex Elementarios uh, methodology. So, uh, um, you know, the, the, the definitions and the way the AJCCP is developed uh, is the methodology that is developed by Codex Elementarios. 
Okay, it's still in operation, then, uh, you know, moving on towards the end of chapter eight, we have the control of production with several different uh, uh, sub items with requirements. Uh, of course, uh, identification and traceability as part of any quality and safety uh, system. The preservation of the product, the way, uh, you know, to have the conservation of the product, the shelf life and how, uh, you know, the validity dates and all these uh, issues. Um, here, post-delivery activities, uh, you may have um, uh, as a requirement from an interested party, for example, your client, that uh, you should provide also technical assistance or then the, uh, and it's being more common in different regions that you also take uh, care of uh, the packaging uh, because of environmental issues and so on. So these are, you know, some examples of post-delivery activities. Release. Um, so um, we must have uh, uh, in our system how we are going to release our final products and based on what criteria. And uh, if we do have criteria and we controlled, we monitored the products, of course, we may have non-conforming products. Uh, and this is going to be uh, approached in the control and non-conforming process outputs and products in chapter eight. And another requirement about rework. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a, a part, it's a step of our, of our flow chart. Uh, maybe we go back to uh, a previous step because the product does not conform to specifications or then, uh, you know, it's a defective product or then we have remainings and then we, uh, we need, we do not want uh, any loss and we want to reintroduce that in the process. So uh, the requirement for uh, re re the rework is there uh, so that we make sure that we are not reintroducing uh, any hazard or we, we to make sure that we did take care of any rework that uh, possibly uh, exists. And then we go to uh, the two uh, final uh, requirements. Uh, they are very short. One is the performance evaluation. And here, um, the chapter nine uh, basically brings three different tools for the evaluation of the uh, performance of the whole system. Uh, so it's the whole uh, of uh, safety and quality system. And uh, uh, they are monitoring. Uh, so how we verify the system uh, and how we check that uh, we achieved uh, the results uh, that were uh, stated uh, and the objectives that were planned for the system. Uh, another tool uh, is the internal audit. A documented procedure will be required for that. Uh, and uh, a program for internal audit uh, should be in place as well. And uh, the third, the third uh, tool will be the management review. Uh, if we look, uh, we we have uh, 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 some uh, small differences in terms of the inputs for the management review. Uh, some were added, uh, but the process is mainly the same. And that gives us also uh, opportunities for continual improvement uh, in the operation of the system, maybe in the revision of uh, the context uh, that uh, uh, we uh, we visited in the first uh, or in the first part of the scheme, uh, because we are now facing different issues as uh, we we are now in this uh, very difficult moment. So how does COVID uh, impact uh, your, uh, you should expect that auditors now uh, will take it, to, it into account when they look at your context. 
So this is, um, you know, also part of the management we review and may trigger, um, you know, opportunities for improvement or add new elements to the system. And the uh, last chapter is chapter 10, uh, where we have the improvement and mainly two topics, non-conformities and uh, the, uh, the continuous improvement with the entries or the outputs that uh, we had from the, uh, uh, the, the three previous uh, elements that we saw in the performance evaluation. And here we can then check uh, the suitability of the system, if it's still working uh, as planned, the adequacy of that, and uh, the effectiveness of the, our system. And uh, something new, the other systems, they usually take uh, these two pillars, fraud and defense, as separate programs. Uh, FAMQ West uh, wanted to make only one big system. So fraud and defense are the two uh, new pillars uh, of our system. Uh, and they are part of the system because they have direct impact on several of the requirements that we saw. And uh, vice versa, the requirements will also impact in the vulnerabilities we have for fraud and also the prevention or the defenses we have in our system. And uh, the idea to uh, uh, include that is because of all these different motivations and drivers um, that you see in, in this scheme as the complexity of uh, chains that we have nowadays, outsourcing that is now, you know, globally spread, it, different regulatory uh, backgrounds in different jurisdictions, uh, fair play. So, you know, all of them uh launched uh, a program and included uh you know uh, showed the need to include uh in the scheme a feed fraud a prevention and uh, defense uh, a requirement so this is uh the newest uh, uh, inclusion in the system uh, so there are requirements and these requirements are mandatory uh, there is uh, a new module for fraud and defense uh, in this new module and the text brings guidance also uh, on how to work with the information, explanations and methods that um, will uh, for sure give support to all the companies to implement the requirements. And also, FAMIQS uh, developed uh, together with PwC, PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, templates for feed fraud and uh, defense. And these templates, uh, the operators uh, will have to use. They will guide us through the process, will help us to develop uh, and, uh, you know, to access the vulnerability and uh, the, the defense uh, uh, that uh, uh, we, we must have in the system. And they will also give support to the auditing process because um, once you have the opportunity to be in contact with this template, uh, you are going to see that it is very, uh, uh, you have to put uh, all the certifications and you have a lot of questions there that drives and directs you to uh, uh, in the assessments uh, to uh, the right answer and uh, that will help you to build your system. And uh, if we go to the next slide, this is the FAMIQS uh, feed, feed uh, fraud and defense uh, program. Uh, it is uh, written in the same structure uh, 
following the high level structure of ISO. So if you take a look, you know, the, the main entries are exactly the same as to have uh, a uniformity and a an standardization of the document. So these are the main uh, features that we have. Now I, uh, I invite and uh, uh, Chris uh, to show you the top non-conformities uh, uh, that we have had in these audit in the audits that were already completed. Um, Chris has been in the field and talking with the companies, and I believe uh, he has a lot of information to give to us uh, and, uh, you know, uh, also some tips on how to uh, uh, implement, not to implement, but on, a, on the difficulties the company have, have had uh, trying to implement the system. So Chris, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, Angela. I appreciate it. Some fantastic information there on clarifying items that uh, have come up or that is new within the standard because it is quite a drastic change uh, from the previous version to the new one. So what uh, we're going to move on to and talk about very quickly, or I usually like to bucket non-conformances when we talk about them into groups of five, but instead of having the top five, we're going to have about the, the top six non-conformances here. Uh, clauses are down on the bottom there. Uh, if you want to look at it and see where it's at, we're going to go through them in a bit detail in a couple seconds, but you can see about of a third of the non of uh, the audits that are conducted are running into issues with uh, the approved supplier program and such that's in place. You're also gonna see as we go through, we have some challenges with HACCP programs, internal auditing, pest control, calibration and such, but we'll run into those, uh, we'll describe those a little bit more further in some of the subsequent slides. If we go to the next slide, we'll end up seeing that we have a nice little list here that actually details the actual section, the clause that is present as well as the clause number and the number of findings. One key point to kind of look at here uh, compared to the graph that was on the previous one. This is the actual raw data, the numbers. The data on the previous slide was for per percentages. And this was a based on about 160 total audits that have already been conducted to version six. Uh, as we, if we move through, why don't we kind of talk about these top six that we were discussing. And this is probably one of the most unique requirements that you'll run into in FAMIQS uh, compared to almost any other standard that is out within the industry. And this is really talking about the management of suppliers and really talking about our assured versus non-assured sources. Angela already brought up the document PMS 00, uh, 003, sorry, uh, and it does describe the requirements in there. I really strongly recommend you do go in there and look at that, understand it, understand that you are going to have to have some recognition of equivalency that's in place, self declarations, uh, if they don't have particular recognized schemes in place and whatnot. Uh, really ensure that you have this documentation present, evaluate all those suppliers in detail. And one key item that I'd like to point out that I run into, not just with FAMI QS audits, but almost any audit that I do is if we are buying from a very large corporation, uh, a lot of sites have company information, but not site specific information. We need to ensure that that approved supplier documentation is site specific. And like any system, do what you say and say what you do sort of deal, right? We wanna make sure our documented program lines up with the practices that are in place. Uh, next slide, we're gonna kind of move to and talk about another item that says document what you say uh, and do what you say you'll do is your HACCP program. Some of the challenges I see here is we don't get granular enough into the details when we're talking about hazards. Uh, a good example would be you look at a hazard like mycotoxins. It's really important that we get a bit more detailed into those requirements as it pertains to something like aflatoxin. We do know that there's some risks and some animals that have more of a susceptibility and a challenge with certain types of hazards that are present versus others. So we wanna make sure we get down 
to the specifics as far as possible, because those will help define the control measures that are in place um, that will be required that may be elevated to a critical control point within our HACCP program. Also want to make sure you're looking at that flow chart. Uh, need to make sure that it is verified. Remember, this is a preliminary step within a development of a HACCP program. We need to make sure that we are verifying it. And really, we need to be verifying it across all shifts and all operations. We need to ensure that that is how everything is following at all times for all products that are covered and for all processes. So it's very important that's done. It's not just sitting in a conference room reviewing it at a conference table and being done. No, we need to be on the floor and verifying that. We do find gaps in that regularly in place. Uh, we did talk about site specific for supplier approval there for a bit. We need to make sure that our validation that is in place for critical control points is site specific. It, it, sometimes we can share information across a corporate group, but there needs to be validation for the plan and the program for the site because these are site specific programs. It's very important we do have that. We need to also make sure that people are clearly aware of the roles and responsibilities in the programs and how things need to be done. We end up finding sometimes challenges that it will be documented or document the names of the documents are not clearly written down as to what needs to fill, be filled out or who needs to do those activities. Very important that you get as detailed as possible so we always have continued uh, application and adherence to the program as written. So after number two, we'll run to number three. Talk about pest control. Now, this one is obviously a challenging one, challenging one sometimes within the feed industry, depending on the, the fabric of a facility. Sometimes we have had to update buildings. Uh, they are a bit older sometimes, just based on the processes that are present. But we do need to make sure that we are looking at all potential ingress locations and all harborage locations that are out of at a facility and eliminating them. A good example is like dock levelers, oh, roof overhangs, is there bird, bird roosting that could be present? We need to make sure we evaluate it. Taking a step back after that or even before that, before looking at seizing up those openings or and continuously being done is looking at your pest control program being risk-based. A lot of times we have situations where pest control programs are off the shelf that are simply, we're gonna do it once a week and once a month and that's it. We don't look at the actual risk for the site. Maybe you need to have more frequent exterior servicing of bait stations because you have a field behind you that's a harvest location and it really spikes in harvest time because all the all rodents are running out there. Maybe you have a challenge with certain times a year with bugs and we need to have an elevated program on that end. We need to really pay attention to that and ensure that the program is designed to facilitate appropriate control. Also, always look at your pesticides being appropriately handled and that you have those records on file. Challenges that I've run into sometimes with sites is we forget to communicate that information to maintenance personnel, sanitation personnel, et cetera, and you find the occasional can of household pesticide in place. So something that really needs to kind of be looked at on that side. And then finally, a very simple, straightforward one is we do need to look at having our schematics that are showing the location of all traps that are used being up to date and current. So this should list temporary traps that are required as well. They should be accurate to the location and the number of traps that are present. So some of this stuff is fairly straightforward, but it can take some time to develop. When we move on to the next one here, looking at measuring devices. This is really a, a key one here is talking about calibration. So really we wanna look at are the devices that we use within the facility that are going to be measuring uh, particular requirements of either a process or a product, are they being calibrated and are they accurate? If they are being used, are they being protected from potential damage? Do we have situations if we do th use thermometers or if we're using pH meters, things like that, are they stored in a location where they won't drop on the floor and get damaged or broken? We need to make sure that we're protecting against those. Are we ensuring that the frequency of calibration is suitable for the process that's in place? We talked about uh, pest control being risk-based. We should be looking at calibration in a way that way uh, as well. But uh, you also wanna make sure that you're taking into account regulatory requirements on that front. Do you need to use external companies? And if you are, 
are you ensuring that that company is accredited to 17025 or an equivalent on that end? And then another thing that the FAMIQS standard pulls in that they specify, which some other standards don't, is talking about the use of computer software. We need to make sure that A, it is verified that it's gonna give us the accurate results that we need, and we need to ensure that it is validated if it is for a CCP, which is used at times. So that is very important information on that end. And then we've got eight point, this is identification and traceability. This is gonna be accounting for our products, our one up, one back, traceability challenge. So ensuring we know what products we used and where we have shipped it to. Are we challenging ourselves on a regular basis? One situation that I find every once in a while is facilities that do their traceability challenges that are required, they do it on the most, uh, the easiest product to recall or to trace, I should say, not recall. They look at what is easy to trace. It's only a two component item. There's not very many micro ingredients in place. We wanna make sure we make our challenges as difficult as possible. We wanna find the problems in our challenges. We don't wanna find, that, find them out when we actually have a situation or when we are being audited. We want to ensure that they are appropriate and functional at all times. You wanna make sure that your batch identification system is clearly defined and being followed throughout, and that all your materials at all times are identified. This seems to be a challenge for things like work in progress or rework, which is something that Angela was talking about earlier as well. Last thing that, I've, that we run into every once in a while is customer information not being accurate or necessary bodies that need to be contacted in the event of a recall. We need to make sure that we are verifying that in the event, we do need to notify customers of a situation where we need to have a recall. So this is kind of linked to both traceability and recall on that side. Internal audits, this is probably your biggest control that you wanna look at. Gaps in here typically seem to be challenges where we aren't really doing full system audits. There's a lot of assumptions that are being made and we're not really pushing ourselves. So one key challenge that I'm running into when I'm running into the V6 facility is, is many have not audited themselves against the FAMI QS version six requirements. This is paramount. You need to have self-control here. It is very important that you have detailed internal audits that are identifying your conformance and your non-conformance at points. Challenge yourself, conduct a traceability challenge during these internal audits, interview your employees, get detailed information as it's going through, gather that evidence and write that information down in the actual internal audit reports. You need to demonstrate compliance. This is your self-control on that end. That being said, if you have challenges where we aren't able to do that once in a while, we need to maybe get training to get that done for the standards. So really take a look at that. Ensure that you are using trained and competent personnel to do it and you're, you're providing enough information to demonstrate that you're in compliance and that you are following up on any non-conformances and verifying those um, if they are identified within these internal audit programs. So to kind of with a takeaway here, some points of action really become clear and understand the version six requirements. Uh, ensure that you are looking at things like a high level structure, which is what Angela was talking about. If you can't get the FAMI training specifically for you, it is challenging at times, but you can look at something like a high level structure training for ISO 9001, ISO 22018. That can help for sure. As we just covered within internal audits, ensure your system has been fully reviewed to meet all the new requirements. If that is something you can't do, always look at potentially having a pre-assessment with a knowledgeable auditor that will help you identify those gaps potentially. They won't recommend technically how to solve that, but you'll at least know where those gaps are at that front. Ensure that you're following up with your new scope approval letter. Since we do have these new processes that are in place, we wanna make sure that we're lining up and we identify everything properly on that end. And then finally, make sure that that, that all your documentation and, and especially the internal audit program is beneficial and meets what you're doing. Avoid your pencil whipping. Continually challenge yourself. Spread your audits out throughout the year so you're not rushed to jam everything in into one or two days. So. Take a look at that, and I think you'll find a lot of success moving into the version six standard. That being said, that concludes the presentation. Thank you very much.